Way. Lasergurke wieder. Lasergurke? Alter. Silly Gurke mal wieder am Start auf Lasergurkenland. Ähm, ja, letzte Episode habe ich noch ge gewitzelt, dass wir jetzt wieder ein, einen weiteren stundenlangen Hacking-Kurs uns reinziehen, aber es sieht so aus, als wäre das diesmal wieder der Fall. Also, äh, let's go. Connecten wir auf sillyhuhn.com dem gratis erreichbaren Anarchie-Server Lasergurkenland. Ähm, alternativ gibt es auch die IP 149.202.107.134. Ähm, ja, eigentlich immer Slots, fly, äh, immer Slots frei. Wir haben hier 20 Slots und niemand online. Also ist eine ganz entspannte Nummer hier. Kann man, <lacht> kann man schon sich mal geben. Ähm, und wir geben uns jetzt mal wieder John Hammond, unseren alten äh, Kollegen hier. Aber mal wieder das Rip-Off vom freecodecamp.org äh, Channel. Ähm, ja, also es ist tatsächlich wieder ein längeres Video. 4 Stunden 44 Minuten ähm, sind jetzt hier geplant. Und es ist tatsächlich das letzte Video in meiner Watch Later Playlist, was äh, Creative Commons hat. Sprich, ich kann hier mit Namensnennung äh, ganz entspannt dieses Video mir hier anschauen und sogar Teile davon zeigen, ohne irgendwelche Copyright-Probleme zu bekommen oder auch ohne vermutlich jemanden zu verärgern, weil, ähm, naja, das eben freigestellt ist zu, zum, zum Re-Upload. Ähm, ja, genau, also channelfreecodecamp.org, aber die haben ähnlich wie ich einfach nur deren Video hochgeladen, ähm, also nur das Video von äh, John wie hieß der Dude jetzt? Hey, what's up? My name is John Hammond. John Hammond. Ähm, auch nur hochgeladen. Ich, ich bin zu faul, das Original zu suchen. Und also, ich werde euch das verlinken, was ich gerade schaue. Ähm, er ist natürlich immer schön, das Original zu unterstützen. Ähm, ja, aber ich glaube, Free Code Camp hat da auch eine Compilation gemacht von. Das sind eigentlich mehrere Videos. Ich weiß nicht genau, wie die das immer machen. Ähm, aber es ist natürlich schön, wenn man nicht Video wechseln muss und einfach hier äh, so lange schauen kann, wie man will, äh, in diesen äh, vier Stunden. Also so selten ist dieses Biom dann doch nicht, wenn wir das hier schon wieder haben. Vielleicht habe ich das auch verwechselt mit einem anderen seltenen Biom. Ähm, genau, alles klar. Ja dann, ähm, let's go. John Hammond. Oh, ich habe den Titel gar nicht genannt. Uh, Improve Cyber Security Skills with CTFs uh, Dash Pico CTF Walkthrough 2018. In Capture the Flag is one of the best ways to learn and practice your cyber security skills. So I hope you learn a lot and please enjoy. This is the first video in uh, my attempt to record what I can of the Pico CTF 2018 game. Um, I'm not going to go through the game rendition of this. I'm just going to be actually solving the CTF challenges through the problems page itself. Um, so I'm, on, I'm running Linux, right? And I'm going to try and make this as beginner friendly as I can for the first uh, segment or so, or for the first like couple of videos in the series. So I'm, I'm still friendly to people that haven't been doing this for, for all too long. Um, so let's go go ahead and get started with the first couple of challenges. Running Linux, so I have the terminal open. Um, I have a folder created for the game. I have a lot of the folders already created for the first couple of challenges that I want to solve in this video. And we'll cre keep creating folders as we move on. So let's just go ahead and get started. Uh, this first challenge here, forensics warm up one. Uh, can you just unzip this file for me and retrieve the flag? So if Sounds you want to click on this and download it and move it into the folder or whatever, what I like to do and I've been doing in a lot of recent videos is just right click on a link and then open or copy the link address so that I can, in my terminal, wgetit, which is default in Ubuntu, or I think it's default in Ubuntu, whatever, um, some Linux systems where we can just download that file. If you don't have it, you can sudo apt or sudo in yum install, whatever package image you're using, hopefully you're running Linux. So that way it'll automatically get the file in our current directory where I'm working with in the terminal. So we have flag.zip, and actually I do want to move this into forensics form of one, um, and I totally forgot the flag file. All right, so one, there we go. Now I can go ahead and work with this thing. If you were to use just a file explorer, you could click on it and open it up, and that's easy and fun and cool, but 
I want to do this from the command line, I want to automate it, so I'm just going to unzip, which is again a built-in, I think, on Linux, where we can, if we have zip tools, we can go ahead and unzip it, and unzip flag.zip, and it will create this new file folder for us, uh, flag.jpg. So I'm going to I of GNOME, or EOG, that image, check it out here, and it says, Pico CTF, welcome to forensics. Um, I'm going to try and write that down. So I just use Terminator right this in this case to go ahead and split my screen. So I'm going to use Pico CTF is all lowercase except for CTFs. And it looks like all of this is lowercase. Welcome to forensics. Cool. So I use nano as a text editor there just to go ahead and save that. And let's paste that in, see if we get the points. Nope, I failed. Ja, okay, das wäre auch ein bisschen Welcome zu einfach. Echt? War es das jetzt? Ein Ordner ansippen und dann die Bilddatei lesen? Was? Oh mein Gott, hat der, hat der, ha, die, ähm, die, wie heißt denn das, Bash, nicht Autocompletion, das haben wir doch hier auch schon in einem Video gesehen, der <lacht> ist ja geil, es gibt tatsächlich Leute, die das verwenden, mit dem, auch oh, wie hieß denn das, Word Split Flop, nee, keine Ahnung, habt ihr jetzt natürlich nicht gesehen. Nano get flag.py. 
get a simple shebang line, which is necessary for the system to know what kind of script we're running. Shebang, ich nenne das immer Shebang. Pico CTF. Shebang. Das heißt wahrscheinlich Shebang. Das heißt wahrscheinlich Shebang. Das heißt wahrscheinlich Shebang. Das I'm going to use the percent sign, and I want to take the string of 0x41, as we expected here. So 0x41 is going to be evaluated to in decimal, because Python represents everything typically in decimal, so it will go 65 first. And actually, I'm sorry, we don't want the string of that. We want the character version of it, or it in ASCII. So it's not str we want. We're not going to convert just the number 65 to a string. We want to convert it to ASCII, so let's do chr to get the ASCII value. Let's go ahead and run Python get flag, and it's Pico CTFA. So, great, let's convert that to yeah. executable, or not, an, not convert to an executable, mark it as executable with chmon, and we can dot slash it, and then if you wanted to, just for any purposes, you can redirect it to flag.txt, but we already have that done for us. So, let's go ahead and submit this. Paste it in. We are correct, cool. And I moved all of that into the, uh, the, the big folder here. Let's put it all in general form. Cool. So let's check out, uh, after we mark that one complete, we can check out general warm-up number two. What do we got here? Can you convert the number 27 to binary or base two? Yeah, we can do that in Python a little bit more as well. Let's go ahead into general warm-up two Let's go ahead and copy the general warm-up one get flag script into this directory. So we can go ahead and nano that. And then instead of actually converting this string of chr 0x411 as we had in the other challenge, let's actually take the number 27, treat it as an integer. And in Python, you can actually pass a second argument to this integer function. And you can say what base you want it in. So I'm going to say 0, 2. But if we were to check this out in Python, uh, comma two, sorry, <laughs> not zero two, so base two. If I were to check out what this gives me in Python, int should be converted as a string. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm totally going wrong here. We want to just run the function bin, because it'll convert it to binary for us, not into. Into will expect to take a string given a base and interpret it as a different number, so bin two was really what we wanted. Except when I run bin2, you'll notice it returns a string for me, but it uses 0b as a prefix to denote that, okay, this is binary numbers here. So we, would, we could actually go ahead and slice that. And slicing in Python just means kind of indexing, but cutting pieces off of it. So if I want to take the second character and like the first two characters off, I could say, let's go 0, 2, let's go two characters in, and then colon to cut from that position, two characters in, all the way to the end. So all we have are the 11011. It just slices that end bit off for us, just like that. So I'm totally wrong. I'm sorry I kind of went down that rabbit hole with, you know, giving you the wrong information. You're trying to call the int function when you should run the binary function. Sweet, whatever. Das ist Let's das Rabbit Hole? Ist das Rabbit Hole nicht eher, dass er die Flag schon seit fünf Minuten hat und irgendwas randomly rumscriptet? Submit. Correct. Awesome. Ja, yeah, der will wohl Scripting file. Basics beibringen, aber irgendwie da gibt es doch sicher bessere Situationen. Let's change directory into general warm-up 3, copy general warm-up 2, all the way, their, their get flag script, all the way into this directory, not too far on the file system. Nano get flag to change the script up, and let's go ahead and change the 0x 3d from decimal into decimal, base 10. So since Python will automatically want to convert this to decimal, it'll go ahead and do that, and then we can run str on it to get uh, the number that we're expecting here. So let's run Python get flag, we get 61, redirect that to flag, text file, xclip it so we have in our clipboard, let's go ahead and paste it in, and we are moving, just like that. So cool, 250 points, just kind of breezing right through some of these, I hope you're learning a little bit, just 
right now this is simple stuff, right? These are just warm-up challenges, but they're still good at to knock out of the way and showcase what you can do with Python. Um, Python is certainly going to be your sword in a capture flag or CTF game, so I don't know, don't take it lightly, know how to do just about everything you want to do with it. In this video, I want to take a look at the resources challenge. It's only worth 50 points. It says, we put together a bunch of resources to help you out on their website. If you go there, you might even find a flag. And here is the link to the page, and it offers just a link that you can click on right here. This challenge is a little trivial. It's not too hard. Uh, really, it's just look at this page and read through it. You've got some links here to check out, general skills, cryptography, web exploitation, forensics, binary exploitation, reversing, and a lot of other really cool stuff. Honestly, I haven't gone through this yet. Um, we actually have, uh, have a featured YouTube channel, so that's pretty neato. Totally want to take a look at that. Oh, it's Mr. Carlisle. He is fantastic. I know him kind of personally through some of my stuff at uh, military academies. So there's a lot of it really interesting like content here that you can totally read through. And I would recommend it, and it's honestly just a good place to go to when you don't know the answer to one challenge or something that you may be looking at, kind of under that umbrella uh, of the category, you know, of the challenge that you're working on. And it's awesome when you're doing that in CTF. So this is certainly a good resource, and that's important to kind of have in our back pocket. At the very bottom, below this video tutorials here, it says, thanks for reading the resources page, here's the flag for your time, which you can copy and paste, take note of, and I'll actually do that, I'm going to create a flag.txt file, as I usually do. And we can go ahead and head back to the original page, submit it for our 50 points. We can put this together in a get flag script if we just copy the link address as we usually do. I'm going to use curl, which you may have seen or used before. If not, you can just sudo apt install curl if you don't have it installed in your system or whatever package manager that you need. So curl will allow us to make a request to the web page and view the output of the page. So like literally seeing the HTML source, you can see the flag right here in the output. So what I'm going to do now is go ahead and pipe that to rep, and a lot of times I've done this in previous videos, so hopefully it's nothing new, but if it's a new technique for you, as you're starting to watch these videos for the first time, cool, hope you enjoy it. Uh, grep, grep will let us search, at least when we're piping, at least with the output that we give into the program. Uh, and I'm using tac o for only, so I want to return only the search results that I return and, and, and wanted to filter for to begin with, and tac capital E to get regular expressions or extended regular expressions. So that way I can use the flag format, Pico CTF, and then the curly braces, and I'm going to use some regular expressions inside here to say period and then a star. So period to match anything, and then a star or asterisk to match multiple, as much as you can of that. So once I run through that, Zero it says or as much a little as bit as of okay. control connection well, stuff, so I'm yeah, going to go ahead and make good. that silent with tack S, and then I'm going to use tack tack <laughs> color mit drin. Non Aber das rep, so we don't get that manipulated. Um, That will return only the flag plus and okay. Sternchen, I'm going to make it get plus braucht mindestens so 1 nano, and Sternchen. Bash is a shebang line, pump that there, mark that as executable, it runs just fine, and we can mark that challenge as complete. Weil eigentlich beide so viele es könnten, ne? Alright, what do we got next? These are, this are, this is, these are words, um, Reversing warm-up number one, 50 points. Throughout your journey, you'll have to run many programs. Can you navigate to this on the shell server and run this program to retrieve the flag? So it allows us to download the program. Let's go ahead and do that. Malware. We're going to make directory for reversing warm-up number one. Head to that directory, w get that file. And if you have not used Linux before, or you just don't particularly know how to run stuff, you will want to dot slash, and that's kind of a term, I, su I suppose, a, the colloquial name that I'm going to go ahead and use that I, that I normally use, because you want to say in this current directory, it's the period with dot to mean the current directory, uh, relative to it, I want to run this file, or whatever program we want to run. Except it has to be marked as an executable. So the way you can do that is the simple chmod command to like change or modify and make, make modifications of the file to add permissions to it, and plus x, that X or the executable bit will mark it as executable, and we just have to supply the file that we want there. So now if I run dot slash run, actually if I were to check out ls, you can see it's highlighted green. And ls tech l, you can see I've added the executable bit to all of the columns here. So myself or the owner, the group that owns it, that's the third column. Again, I, it's still me and my group that owns it, and then everyone. So everyone can run this. 
Now dot slash run and we get the flag. So if we wanted to put that as get flag or, or redirect that to a static file and we can actually just move the program itself to name get flag. Simple stuff. Okay. Let's go ahead and submit this flag. Easy. And as usual, mark this challenge as complete. Okay, next challenge, reversing warm up number two, is can you decode the following string from base64 format into ASCII? So, base64 is super duper common in capital flag competitions. If you haven't seen it before, you can simply Google it. Base64 on Wikipedia is a type of encoding or a scheme of representing characters and data information in a peculiar way. It is pretty easy to identify because it'll look like a lot of seemingly random like letters and uppercase, lowercase letters with occasional numbers thrown in and the only other characters aside from that that are acceptable are a plus sign and a forward slash. So those are the acceptable characters in the base64 format. And you'll see those just maybe rarely, but the most common stuff are seemingly random uppercase, lowercase letters, more uppercase than usual sometimes, and that's what makes it kind of easily identifiable. The most important telltale about base64 is that it ends the, the, like the very, very end of the string, or of the encoded data, is a normally a set of equal signs. It's, it doesn't have to have a set of equal signs, because the, the reason that the equal signs are there is because the length of this data has to be a multiple of four. So if the encoded information, like if the transformation of regular letters into their encoded form does not end up giving you a perfect factor of four, like multiplicant, that's the word multiplicant, mm -hmm. if, if it's not a multiplication factor, if it's not a multiple of four, it will add these equal signs at the very, very end as padding to make sure that it will eventually, like it, it, you'll have one, two, three, or none sets of equal signs there at the very, very end to make sure that it's the length of a multiple of four. So, peculiar thing. In this case, we don't have a equal sign at the very, very end. And, okay, if we wanted to, we could just go to an online tool to basically hold the equal information. There are a lot of these that are crappy and stupid and dumb, and they waste a lot of time, in my opinion. I want to be able to automate this process. I want to be able to do it from the command line, or from Python, or whatever that we're working with. So, there is a utility, Base64, that you can just have on your command line. And normally I would echo stuff into this. I would just pipe it in, and that will decode it for us just fine. Um, another tactic that I've kind of seen, which may be another interesting style, is if you read it in at the very, very end by using these three less than redirection signs. So, just like that, and you'll still decode it. Python can do this as well. You can just have a string, and you can do dot decode. Oh mein Gott, sind das viele! Ich, mir platzt gleich eine Ader im Auge. Jungs! Oh. Okay. So, und ich gehe da runter, boah, ich gehe da runter, Leute, ciao. Fuck, das steht da im Auto hier. You could have just <laughs> created a bash script, B. Uh, let's go ahead and run that, redirect it to flag.txt. Bash beste. Ja, ja, funktioniert doch nicht schlecht hier. Oh, das ist meine Lava schon wieder hingeglückt. Leute. Cool. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, it's been fun. Uh, I think the first set of Pico CTF challenges are for someone that does a little bit of CTF stuff, like that's used to this kind of material, this kind of content, this stuff is pretty easy to run through, and I'm trying to describe what I can, 
And if you haven't seen this one, I will not jump into too difficult concepts or, or being too quick on the keyboard for some interesting things. This first one, Crypto Warm Up 1, 75 points. It says Creepy Toe, <laughs> or uh, a typo on crypto, that's funny. Can often be done by hand. Here's a message to that from Glenn, seemingly gibberish, with the key of This is a little key. Can you use this table to solve it? So let's go ahead and uh, just download this. I'm actually going to do this in. I'm going to use Curl for this. Let's make a record for it. Creepy Toe. <laughs> So this is the table that it suggests us to look at, right? And this essentially is trying to put together or, or illustrate um, the encryption and decryption of another message or a plain text, a plain text message. Yes. A specific <laughs> so I did it. Letter by letter, you would look at one of the letters that, okay, let's say, is in the original uh, plain text message. I'm sorry. Walking on, I'm trying to think about this. And you would use that as a row or a column. And then you would use the other first letter or the corresponding letter position in the key. And you'd use that as the other, maybe your column or row. And then because of this transition on the table, because it shifted, uh, the alphabet is shifted kind of letter by letter in this case, as you kind of move either across one row or down one row, as, as you can see. Um, that is what is going to end up giving you the letter of, or, <coughs> excuse me, the letter of your ciphertext. So the letter inside the grid here, or inside the table, is what you would expect to see as your ciphertext. So in our case, we're given something a little bit interesting. We're given this LL blah 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 with this is a little key as the key here. So I'm just going to paste this so we know what it is, and this is a little key. And I'm going to try and illustrate this or explain this and how we would go ahead and decrypt it by hand, but I'm not going to have us decrypt it by hand because that's stupid and dumb. We're smarter than that, and we know that we can automate these things. So let's say we had the letter L, and that's our, our ciphertext, right? And we know that it is in the middle of the grid because it's our ciphertext. But we also know it's going to be in the T column of something, right? because the key in the corresponding side is a what we're using as one edge or the, the boundary and barrier of this, this table here. So let's find L in, let's say, a T column here. So I'm going to move down until I find L. There it is. And if I move all the way from that L to determine what it would be on the plain text side or what we deem to be the plain text side, we would see S. So we know that S is going to be the first letter of our plain text. Let's do the same thing for L, but now this H as what we're using from our key. So H, let's say the column here, look for, again, L. So, I'm sorry. We see that the following letter should be E. So, so C, die, die Dinge E. Mitnehmen, so diese whatever that could mean nee. following, we could go through that procedure Scheiß until we got Lass it. Man nicht However, sterben. I want oh, to kind enlighten you and teach you a little bit more about what we're actually looking at here. So this whole block, this whole this whole diagram, this whole table that we see is the alphabet shifted over and over again in a peculiar way, right? It's just one character by character. So the real name of this is something that is associated with Vigneer. And I'm saying that wrong. I don't know the but the Vigneer, Vigneer, whatever, that cipher is a form of a polyalphabetic substitution cipher. And it uses a table, or the veneer table, which is the veneer square, which is exactly what we're looking for. That's that text, table.txt file that we just downloaded. So this is a veneer cipher. We can actually, if we wanted to, do something online. Let's just get like a veneer cipher decoder. And just take a link here. That's perfectly fine. Let's say, OK, cool, it already knows what we're doing here, because I tested this earlier. We have the cipher text that we can paste in. We know the key, so we can paste that in, and then we can run decrypt veneer, and it says secret message. That is the full decryption, the full original plain text given the cipher text and keeping it. So I actually have another video on writing this or doing this in Python, and I think it's part of the TJCTF video series, and I do this often, right? I, the veneer cipher is a kind of a common thing in capital flag competition, so you can totally find it. Um, I certainly have videos on it. But Right now, we know that our flag is a peak 
go CTF, secret message. And I could write something to do a get flag script so that's running this, um, but I'm not going to track down that. Actually, uh, screw it. I'll track down that code. Let's see if I still have it. I may not because I tried to clean my hard drive. Square in your cipher. Looks like I have it. Or a copy of it. Oh, these, I have it in my original Pico CTF folder. So let's try that. Subwolf in your cipher. Pull it up. And I have insert the message that I'm using, or really the, the ciphertext that I want to see, so I'm going to run decrypt on it, encrypt it, this is the little key, and what I'm doing is I'm taking the lowercase letters of the alphabet, and I don't know if I'm going to probably remove that, but I guess it's doing it just fine. And I loop through the key, if it's not the same size, I iterate it and cycle it if it's not the same size, because you will have to repeat the key until it's the length of the message that you originally see, if your key is less than that. But since our key is 13 characters and our message is 13 characters, it's totally fine in this case. Uh, I remove punctuation because that's kind of a habit and the standard that you would do in the near cipher. And then I try to take the position that I see or the cipher letter and the key letter that I'm finding, finding their original index and shifting or rotating the alphabet, just as you would see on that Vignir square from the Vignir table, and then determining what the new character is based off of the index of the cipher. So I'm essentially automating what we did when we visually looked at it, and I put it all together. And decrypt, I just go the other way on that table. So I can run this, and we see secret message. So I'll save this as getflag.py, and I will print out Pico CTF with the format specifier formatting decrypt in there. That is our get flag script. So mark that as executable. And we've already got that flag saved, so we're good. Let's mark that crypto warm up challenge as complete. And I should probably copy the flag. <laughs> Go ahead and save that. Oh, it's not running because I changed the directory name. Stupid me. Okay, wir machen mal zwei, weil wenn es das nächste Mal passiert, dann... Oh, ne? oh it probably doesn't even need it. I think it's just... Oh my goodness. Let's check out what, what have I done? Your answer in our competition flag format. For example, your answer was... Oh, please use all caps for the message. Odd? Let's, uh... Let's change that up. In our script. Äh, uh, brauche ich überhaupt was aus der Enderkiste? Nicht wirklich, gell? Market flag script in here. Momentan nicht. That, there we go. That's much better. Sorry about that. Okay. Properly spelled crypto. Cryptography doesn't have to be complicated. Have you heard of something called Rot13? So if you don't know this, again, you can Google it. Rot13. It is a simple letter substitution that is essentially a Caesar cipher, right? If you haven't heard of a Caesar cipher, it is that shift. Ja, ich lasse jetzt hier stehen. Keine Ahnung, bin zu rich. Rot13 is moving the alphabet kind of in half, right? Because 26 letters, 13 of them, so you just move them over to the other side of the alphabet. You can read more a little bit about the page, but it's a common, common thing. Again, you have online tools if you want to work with them. You can paste them in and get the flag just like that, Pico CTF, this is crypto. If you want to do it from the command line and automate everything just like I do, you can go ahead and do that. Let's get the installed from PSD games, so sudo apt install PSD games, and you get uh, Caesar, which allow you to actually control the shift, but Rot13 will only shift by 13 characters, so that's kind of a, a, an interesting thing, a peculiar thing, and a good tool to have in your command line toolkit. Let's check out grep1, because this is another simple, simple challenge. You can find the flag in this file. We don't need it on the shell server. Let's just go ahead and download it. And we have used grep before in a previous video, so hopefully it won't be too hard to pick up or grab, just because I've, I've tried to showcase it a little bit before. Make directory grep, and let's mark it as complete. <laughs> just because we're confident and we know we're going to get it, let's uh, download this. And let's grep for... Pico 
CTF. Let's do everything. Let's just get the flag format that we want out of the file, and just like that, easy. Let's get color equals not in there. You may have to do the, it, the same thing because your ending hash or the hexadecimal stuff that's added at the end of your flag will be specific to your account, so don't use my flag. So I'm kind of simple in this case, but knowing the flag format is what is important in this case. And rep to just quickly hunt and search for stuff is important. If we were to actually check out the file, there's a lot of nonsense in here, right? And it's probably all on one line. So we would just regularly rep. You could just rep for, oh, let's look for Pico CTF uh, in the file. And, oh, I guess you'll find it anyway. It is on its own line. Peculiar, cool, but good to know. If you want to, yeah, it's on its own line. Wow. If you want to determine only what you are returning, just to use that tag lowercase o and you'll get only, which is, which is a good hint. So let's submit that. Um, all right, netcat. Using netcat will be a necess, whoa, sorry, will be a necessity through a throughout your adventure. I gotta stop this video, <laughs> I'm gonna lose my tongue. Can you connect to this at this port to get the flag? I've covered Netcat a lot, and it's super important in a lot of like CTF challenges and, and capture the flag competitions. So let's go ahead and make a directory for this challenge. Simply Netcat, I probably could have marked that as complete, but Netcat to a specific host. If you don't know what Netcat is, it is a program that will allow you to connect to a remote host on a service on a specific port. So some software or some script or some code that's running on that service or kind of controlling that socket is what you are connecting to and what you're going to interact with. So you netcat to a specific host at a specific port, and as you are connected, it says, hey, that wasn't so hard, and it gives us the flag. So super simple challenge. I'm going to use tail tack n, so I get the very last line, and that is going to be our get flag script. Bang line as usual. Pump our line in there. Mark it as executable. Flag.txt. Yeah, Next yeah. flip it. And we can paste that in. So, cool. Hopefully that one is another simple and easy. Uh, wanted to showcase a little bit of the cryptography stuff and showcase a simple grep and net. So, we're moving through Pico and hopefully we'll get into some of the more fun and hardcore interesting stuff later on, but certainly the first couple of levels are a little trivial and very, very beginner friendly for people that uh, have seen this kind of stuff before. This video is on the Here's Johnny challenge. This for is Johnny Rippo, oh, It says, okay, so we found some important looking files on a Linux computer. Maybe they can be used to get a password in the process. Connect uh, with Netcat shell uh -huh. to Pico CTF 4015. Uh, 40157, whatever. Again, your host name and port number will be different than mine, so connect with your thing. And files can be found here, password and shadow. So let's go ahead and copy these, I'll download them. Let's make a directory for here's Johnny. And let's get these files. Uh, password and shadow. Gotcha, all right, so let's check out what this password file is. Looks like it is just the root information here, so the the information for the root user, that's just fine. So if you haven't seen this before, this is what we can assume is just a segment or a piece out of the etc. password file on a Linux computer. So if I were to check out cat etc. password, then you have all the user account information for the things that are on a Linux computer. So my root user here, and that, that has all those information. The other information that is stored for kind of the login or user account information on this computer is stored in etc. shadow. And it's interesting because that's visible from, or, or noted anyway, referred to by this X here. Because you have the username in the first column, all columns separated by colons here, and the password is following in the next, the next column. But obviously the password for this user or the root user isn't just X. So the X means that the password is shadowed invisible in etc. shadow. So interestingly enough, etc. password is world readable. That means that etc. password, if I check out the permissions on it, everyone is able to read it. Like root only has read and write, 
everyone in the group has read, um, and everyone in the world, or all user accounts anyone has read access to. But it said a shadow is not that way. Only root and the shadow group can read it. Everyone does not have permission to read it. So I would need to be root to be able to take a look at that. Um, I think I can safely head this. I'm going to pause the video to make sure. Yeah, this is fine to show because the my Ubuntu system, the root user does not have a password, and these other accounts are not things that can be logged into. So in my case, the exclamation point means that root does not have a password in this case. But if we were to check out the shadow file provided to us, which we were able to read, you can see that they supply here uh, seemingly a hash or some encrypted data uh, that represents the password. So we can crack this password or crack this information with a brute force methodology. And that's actually what the hints refer to in this challenge. If you check them out here, it says if at first you don't succeed, try, try again and again and again. So it's referring to a brute force attack to test me. Oh, and this plus plus is an error cute than a classic. So the tool to do that is, again, referred to in the title here, John the Ripper. And I've showcased this a little bit before. You can check out John the Ripper. Uh, they have a website here, a Wikipedia page that explains a little bit more about it. Um, I'm going to end up going for the like repository for the community edition, uh, John the Ripper Jumbo, Jumbo John, I think it is. And that has the GitHub repo that I'm going to go ahead and clone. And it takes a little bit to compile it, but this is um, what's necessary, in my, in my opinion, because you have more tools and more toolkits, um, like other scripts that will allow you with different kinds of information, like a JWT, a Java web token, or uh, some radius information. So everything will be converted to a format that John the Ripper or simply John can go ahead and read and, and crack and process. So I'm going I'm to go ahead and git clone this. If you don't have git installed in your system, that's totally fine. Just sudo apt install git or whatever your package manager is. I'll git clone this. Great. Take some time. Let's check out what it says or how to install. How to install. See the install file. Great. All right. Install file. Is that even readable? Press T, <laughs> T install. Wahrscheinlich in Doc und nicht in Source. Bliert. John. Yeah. So moving to source, get some dependencies, get more dependencies, except you have a key you. So you can load this, you can see this part. Clone and build. So really just run configure and make. And then we can go ahead and run. I'm gonna wait till this downloads. So I didn't end up waiting for it to download. I just went ahead and copied <laughs> the file that I originally used for my for my real source files of playing Pico CTM. Um, so Suspended, suspended disbelief there, sorry, you can you can get clone that on your own if you'd like, but once you have it downloaded, move into that repository and you do want to move into source, just as the installation documentation said, and you would run dot slash configure, and that will take a lot of time to do some things, uh, like a lot of time, so hopefully you can have some patience for that, and then the next command that we wanted you to run was make, and I think make install would follow that, so they say make clean and make, that's just fine. I probably I already have this actually compiled and made and everything, and, but I have to proclaim disclaimer: it does take a little bit of time. So note that. And once you have it all done, you can just move into the run directory, and then you should have all the files and information already completed for you. But it's all compiled and ready to use. So forward slash John is the John the Ripper program. If I run this, it's just John and needs some information, but. We don't have files that are currently in the format that John the Ripper can actually read and process. So let's check out what our options are. And I'm going to point us in the right direction that we have a utility called unshadow. And unshadow, when it's given a shadow file and a password file, it'll convert into something that John can read. So we can use the password file and the shadow file that's been provided to us from the Pico CTF challenge to begin with and go ahead and create something. So let's move up directory and work with the password file, move up the directory again and work with the shadow file, and this output is now the format that John can read. So let's go ahead and put that in, I guess, this directory, that's totally fine for us. So let's just use, yeah, uh, P 
pico user dot text, and that's totally fine. We'll give we'll end up giving that to the John file. John can actually just take that as we wanted to as pico user, and it'll get started running. Uh, dot slash John, sorry. And what this method is going to do is simply brute force. Um, I didn't expect it to get it that to get it done that quickly. Um, the other methodology that you could use is a dictionary attack. So the dictionary attack is when you're using a dictionary, right? Uh, passwords are potential things that it could be, and that is what the next hint is referring to when it talks about the RockU file. RockU, if you check it out, Google it a little bit. RockU is a password list. RockU text. RockU password list, and that file is ginormous. It's huge. Um, it's actually going to take three minutes to get download this thing. You can find it online, and I would recommend downloading it, but it's literally just a plain text file of all, a bunch of words, a bunch of English words. Let's see if I have it. I know I do, because it's going to be. Yeah, let's copy it into this directory, and if I were to cat out rocku.txt, it's a bunch of words or potential passwords or stuff that it could be um, used as a password. So let's go ahead and try that. Let's use John with Pico user.txt and you can say tac tac word list equals rocku.txt. But it sucks because I'm running this already. Um, tactic show. Tactic show. Do I have a john.pot file in here? If, if you end up running John twice and you're actually accidentally kind of not able to view the password that you want to see that you've already, for whatever reason, like uncovered, you can go ahead and remove the john.pot file that's in that directory that you're working with, and that's kind of John's save file. So it won't, it, it won't not do what it's supposed <laughs> to do again. Oh, it's fuck. Go ahead and, and run the process. That's that that. Of it. So remove the john.pot file and you can go back to testing and stuff that we were doing before. So again, John the Ripper found the password is kiss me to the root user. It may be different for yours. So now that we know that, we can go ahead and go back to the original challenge prompt that's explained to us like, oh, this is something that we may want on the service here. So let's go ahead and copy this netcat command to use the username as root to log in with, because that's what we know what's in the shadow and password file. And the password that we now know is kiss me. We enter that and we get the password just like that. Let's go ahead and make a get flag script out of this. I'm going to echo root, and then I'm going to echo kiss me. I'm going to pipe those into netcat just like this, and I'm going to cut this with the first field of spaces, but I'm going to reverse it first, so the first field essentially becomes the last field, but now I have to reverse it again, so I've just cut out only the flag that I want. Cool. Interesting technique, of the right? second but that's field how we do it. Was so was hat er gemacht? Äh. Mhm. Wieso überhaupt? Ähm. Oh, fuck. Das war jetzt gerade sehr verwirrend, was der gemacht hat. John, what you doing? Um. Okay. Okay, der kriegt das so raus und dann reversed er das und nimmt das erste. Nee, das check ich nicht. Ich habe keine Ahnung, was er da macht. Some new line characters just put together some echo inputs and give that to the, the service that we're connecting to and retrieve that column that we wanted from the flag. So, nano get flag dot sh. Paste in that quick one liner for us, marked as executable. Redirect that to flag dot text. Copy it and submit it for. 100 points. Awesome. This challenge is called strength. Okay, um, 
Ja, wir sind jetzt schon 45 Minuten rein hier. Ähm, sagt man das im Deutschen überhaupt? Lol. Ähm. Und das ist jetzt schon das, was? Zweite, dritte. Ich glaube, es ist das dritte Video, was jetzt anfängt. Dann würde ich sagen, was das mal wieder hier für die Episode dieser Dauerwerbesendung. Natürlich nicht vergessen, hier auf Laser Online zu spielen, dem gratis erreichbaren Minecraft Anarchie Server ohne Administration und Regeln wo ihr eure wilden Fantasien ausleben könnt. Ähm, erreicht man unter der IP-Adresse 149.202.137.134 äh, und ich kann nicht reden und schreiben gleichzeitig bzw. nicht was anderes schreiben als das, was ich rede. Alternativ gibt es noch die Domain sillyhuhn.com ähm, Ja, und dann würde ich sagen, sehen wir uns in der nächsten Folge dieser Dauerwerbesendung wieder und ähm, haut rein.